interesting to the people here. Um, but I want to just give you a sense of what the book is um, before we head into that part. So um, there we go. All right. So um, this book actually came out of research for my previous book, Having It All in the Belle Epoque, which was about how these innovative women's magazines in the early 1900s tried to undo the record, the wreckage of the woman writer's terrible reputation that was built over the course of the 19th century in France by consciously constructing this fabulous new ideal of the woman writer as this woman who could perfectly balance femininity and feminism and having kids with having a career. And they did that through the new technology of photography. And so that's what that previous book was about. And um, you can sort of see the shift there from the 1840s um, and the caricatures of the terrible child abandoning um, women writers, um, cautionary tale, to the 1900s version of these magazines of what the ideal could be. Um, as a way of, of celebrating what this new kind of woman, female role model could be. So in the course of that research and in writing, um, in, in studying these women's magazines, I came across this figure who's the, sub, the first part of my book, um, always referred to as Madame Jane Dulafoy. And she was absolutely not the image that I just showed you. She was not the hyper feminine balancing anything remotely resembling femininity with feminism at the time. Um, she was dressed in these impeccable men's suits looking very austere in the photo you see on the left um, and having these kind of conservative vantage points um, often seen um, next to her husband in their kind of collaborative partnership um, similarly clad. And I didn't quite know what to do with her because she didn't fit in at all to the framework. And she was really the exception. There was nothing else like that in the magazine. So when I was moving on from that book, um, I knew that was the first thing I just kind of wanted to explore. I just want to understand who this person was. And what I found out um, was, you know, that the only way, it's not that I discovered this person, Jane de la Foy, um, as a pants wearing archaeological explorer um, celebrity of um, the, uh, the late 19th century, which I'll tell you more details about in a minute. Um, people, scholars have talked about her and she was very well known at the time, but always through the lens of feminism, always as a kind of feminist. Um, and that's really been the only lens for scholars, for historians, to look at women in this time period who disobeyed, for people who didn't fit into models of femininity or, or gender roles, right? They have to be feminists. That's the only way of understanding them. Um, and that's through not an understanding of feminism at the time, which was very limited and had to do with very specific political and legislative um, pushes. But according to our understanding of feminism as sort of anything that is protesting patriarchal structures, right? Anything that's challenging um, gender norms. And that feminist history is really important because that's how we know about Jura Foy and the two other subjects of my book. Because of feminist studies and women's studies and all this great scholarship of the past 30, 40 years, that's how we know about these people. But feminism leaves out a whole part of gender studies, it leaves out any aspect of gender history, of queer history, of trans history. And I quickly realized when studying Jules Lafoy that what was at stake for her was not her identity as a woman, that she was actually really working in tension with that. And that by not asking the right questions, we were missing out on this whole, on really what was most interesting about her and on what her life was really about. And so this book is, it's a triple biography of Jules Lafoy along with the two, two other figures um, Rachild and Marc de Montifou, who lived at the same time, in the same place, more or less, more or less same time, more or less the same place. It's a triple biography that takes the modern trans framework as a way of understanding um, these figures' lives and what was so fascinating um, and, and challenging and, and interesting about them. And so it shows us that um, their refusal to behave in certain socially accepted ways wasn't in order to reject patriarchal structures, but rather the gender binary. And in some cases, even the category of women itself. And so it's a kind of trans history um, and, a, and a, hopefully a model, a kind of framework for a certain kind of trans history that stretches back to before we had the language to talk about it. And really my argument is um, that this you know, gender nonconformity has been around for a really, really long time. In fact, these writers, one of the things that links them is their turn to history, 
all three of them really looked to history to find um, sort of their gender fluid kin, I, I call it in, in, in certain places. They were constantly looking for models of other people, other gender crossers with whom they could identify. Um, and what this book tries to show is that it's not, trans is not new. It's the language that's new. Um, it's addressing, so there are all these questions that are so often mistakenly perceived as new, as like sort of part of modernity or part of pro some kind of progress narrative. It's really the, just the language that we have to talk about it that's new and not the questions that eventually allowed that language to emerge. Those questions, those people, those identities have been around and, um, and being explored for a very long time. Um, so so a quick word just on pronouns, My figure, the three people that I talk about um, are what we would call transmasculine. They were considered women, but they identified with masculinity. And, um, but I, use the, I continue to use the female pronoun, even though had they lived today, who knows you know, what pronoun they would have chosen. Um, I'm not trying to say that these figures were something specific that we can label today. It's not about the labels. It's about a framework that allows us to see the stakes and the questions of their identity um, that they were working out. Um, and so, but I continue to use female pronouns just to sort of be historically accurate um, and to preserve this disjunction that they lived between who they knew themselves to be and how they could speak through the language. It's, it's, it's a super complicated question, which I'm happy to, to talk about um, later on, but I just wanted to, to mention that. But I do not refer to them as women in the book. They sometimes refer to themselves that way, but not always. Um, I try to just really talk about them as writers and as people to really help us to think about the past um, in a more expansive and inclusive way and not assume that we know someone's gender identity just because they use the pronouns that were in use at the time. Um, so I want to get just give you a little taste of Jules Lafoy and I thought I would do that by reading just from uh, quickly from the beginning of the book um, and maybe a peek at the others and then I will um, let Rachel into the, the convo. Um, okay, so this is the from the very beginning. And I would just say, sorry, as a little frame, um, gender stories, which I'll, I can talk about more later, but the idea is these were writers and my book is really about how they understood themselves, how they used writing to make sense of lives um, that didn't have a language um, or a label. And when you don't have a particular term to apply to yourself, stories can be in place of that. Um, and so um, that's, Part of this idea of the the gender story the way that they worked through their own identities through stories um so that title of that section is masculinity forgotten country because that was really jane's gender story so jane judafoy might be the most famous french person you have never heard of in 1882 judafoy and her husband marcel a civil engineer and architecture enthusiast left their comfortable home in the southern city of toulouse to travel the unpaved roads and mountain paths of Baghdad and Turkey, all the way to Persia in what is modern day Iran. I don't have to tell Jews what Persia is, but sometimes people don't know what that is. <laughs> um, they hoped to excavate the ancient city of Susa, which British explorer William K. Loftus had located decades earlier, but failed to unearth. What they found exceeded their wildest expectations. Extensive palaces buried underneath the sandy rock strewn hills forgotten by time and nature. After two government sponsored missions, the couple finally returned to France in 1886 with 40 tons of artifacts. Um, from the royal homes of Darius and Artaxerxes. Resettled in Paris, they celebrated with the opening of the Salle du La Foi at the Louvre, leading to record breaking crowds for the museum's new Department of Oriental Antiquities. And you can still build these rooms as I did a, a couple of, uh, sorry, you can still visit these rooms as I did a couple of years ago um, in Paris in the, that same department. Jane and Marcel du Lafoy were a veritable fin de siècle power couple. They lectured about town, hosted an exclusive salon where they staged theatrical performances, hobnobbed with Prime Minister Raymond Poincaré and were regularly invited to the president's receptions. All the while, the staunchly Catholic Julafoy went about in the most stylish men's suits. Julafoy first appeared in men's clothing when she fought alongside Marcel in the Franco-Prussian War, 
just months after they were married. She returned to this practice on the voyages to Persia a decade later, never to wear skirts again. This despite the fact that it was hardly fashionable for upper class Parisians to do so, and certainly not in her socially conservative milieu where feminism was something of a dirty word and corsets remained the unchallenged norm. Julafoy and her peers recognized the intellectual capabilities of women and supported their efforts to take on increasingly visible roles. But within this social sphere, women were careful not to appear rebellious in order to avoid comparison with the menacing figure of the feminist seeking emancipation or the new woman. And that's sort of the, the model of those magazines that I showed you, right? That balance not being too um, scary looking. Both were perceived, both the new woman and the feminists were perceived as a threat to French traditions. Instead, shifts in gender roles in Dulafois's upper bourgeois circles were contingent on balancing modernity with conventional notions of womanhood. Nonetheless, Dulafois, there she is with Marcel, um, had um, secured a permission de travestissement, what I call a, a pants permit, um, because it was illegal uh, in the 19th century for Parisian women to circulate in men's clothing without one. As of a city ordinance established in 1800, any woman who dress, wishes to dress as a man was required to have the signature of a health official attesting to her medical need to do so. It's not clear how Jules Foy qualified, and this isn't her pants permit, this belonged to the painter Rosa Bonheur, and there's a, a cafe um, named after her, and that's where this pants permit can be seen. Um, but Julafoy was one of only a handful of other people to take this measure. Julafoy found a way to express her gender in a way that to all appearances um, made her comfortable and confident. But there were signs that as she lived this unconventional life, she puzzled over who she was. She kept a notebook filled with clippings containing any mention of gender crossing or pants permits from current events, social commentary, or fiction. When her own name appeared in these accounts, it was underlined with a blue pencil. Okay, um, I don't want to take, I don't want to do too much more talking at the outside. So I'll just give you a quick visual glimpse of um, the other two figures. Um, the second one is Rachel, who was a more popular woman writer, um, who a writer who um, is more studied, even more studied by scholarship because her, her texts so much engage with, um, with gender, with questions of gender and sexuality. So Rachel has really been rediscovered by, by feminism and women's studies in the past 20, 30 years or so, um, and really been misunderstood because she was so contradictory. It never really lined up with feminism, but she's seen as more of a rebel. Um, and I argue that this I, her gender story, to be strange enough or nothing at all, was a way of occupying space that didn't end up mislabeling her. And so for by people not understanding who she was, that was more comfortable than putting her in any particular box, even if it was a kind of, um, you know, uh, not, a, not, not a very positive um, version of her. Um, and the last figure um, is Marc de Montifaux, who was more known for her art criticism initially. Um, her story is I am me, je suis moi. She had this kind of defiant persona um, where she was really angry a lot of the time. Um, and that anger was a part, partly about the difficulty to translate herself into words and also about the, um, um, the being really un, un, unhappy and angry about people constantly wanting her to explain herself. She simply wanted to be able to be herself. Um, these photos kind of take you down the road of the experiments that she had in, in her gender expression until she finally settled on, on the third one. Um, and kind of gained a kind of peace that way. It was a little less angry and um, controversial for a time. So that's just your, your, your quick visuals and I'll let, I'll let Rachel guide the conversation. Um, I probably should un unshare the screen so that we're not so small, right? Okay. You're still, you're still muted. Do I have to unmute? Okay. I know, I'm good. Uh, I just want to begin by thank you, thanking you for, for, for doing this book talk. I, um, I was saying to Paul earlier that in the, you know, the 14 years we live next door, I would often, as I walk by your house, look over and sort of think to myself, Rachel's up there working. <laughs> and she's, and I know that she's, and like, I know roughly what she's thinking about, found to see echo, you know, French women writers, but I, I often wondered, you know, what was going on for you? What was on your mind? What you, what were you thinking about? And every so often, 
on a walk to synagogue, you would share with me, in fact, I think we did speak about Jane Je Je Foy, um, mm -hmm. Shul one day, and, um, and some of the ideas you were thinking about. And it is such a tremendous gift to actually now read your book and to be able to see, you know, these are the ideas that were percolating in your head, and this is the area of research that interests you. And so for those of us who know Rachel already as a, you know, fellow congregant, um, this is a, like a great opportunity to, to see this whole other dimension. So thank you for letting us into your work in that way. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Um, and I want to, I actually want to ask you a little bit more about these three subjects that you chose uh, to focus on. As I read the book, it was obvious to me that you developed deep, deep you know, feelings for each one of them, deep kind of understanding of who they were. And part of what's so interesting about this book is that you do it through, largely through close reading of ephemera. So, you know, not just what they've written in, in, uh, in their nonfiction or fiction works, but also how they appear in photographs and the travel logs they kept. And as you just said, the blue pencil marks they made in their own clipping and scrapbooks. So I would actually love to ask you a twofold, twofold question. The first part is, you know, why these three, besides the obvious, like they had this, this thing in common that's interesting to you, but like, what is it about them in particular and their, their stories that made these three so compelling as opposed to two of them, as opposed to reaching out farther? What was it about these three? And second of all, how did you build your study around these ephemera? In other words, how did you decide what was a tool that you could use to try to unlock how they understood their own gender identities versus something that wasn't open to you for that. Thank you. Um, okay, great questions. Um, I think that um, it, you know it's a, it was it's a, in some ways a very in some ways it's the sequel to the second book, and in some ways it's it's very different because I'd never written biography before. I wasn't really trained to do that, um, but I found with Julia Foy when I. What happened was I started reading after when I started to go down this road and she, I was reading her novels um, and she has these two novels where girls essentially become boys um, and a lot of narrative around it. And it's not a kind of disguise. It's not a Yentl situation or Mulan or, you know, that sort of thing at the end. Um, it was really about the transition. It was so intensely packed with feeling around those descriptions. And I found, I didn't really, I mean, I started with the, with the novels and it's not that I generally do a biographical reading of a novel. I mean, I'm a literature professor where you sort of trained not to do that. Um, so it was a different kind of work. And, um, but it was so clear to me what, what happened was I was reading some trans, first person trans memoirs around the same time. Joy Layden's, for example, that was actually the first one that I read. Um, and I started to see that. And Joy Layden is a professor at YU who's also your colleague. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ironically. Um, uh, it all comes back to Yeshiva University, which makes perfect sense. Um, right. So I was reading her memoir, which is gorgeously written and so evocative. And I, and I thought, I realized I didn't know anything about trans identity. This is already, you know, many what is many, many years ago in terms of the trans moment that we're, we're living in now or the trans tipping point as it was called a couple of years ago. Um, so probably around 2011 or so that I was reading this stuff, started reading up, was reading more trans memoirs because I wanted to sort of uh, um, just sort of be in the head. And, and it, what Joy Layden's memoir made so vivid was just the experience of it, right? The psychology of it, what it felt like to live in a trans body, which I could never know and was very um, concerned about academically, as a scholar, as a writer, to take on this project. That wasn't really my starting point. But as I was just trying to get a sense of Jules Foy, I didn't realize that would sort of be the whole book. Um, and I realized that she was trying to translate herself into narrative and that many of these trans memoirs talk about the stories they told themselves as children, how they first understood themselves. And of course, right, we all make up stories as children to make, to make sense of things that we don't understand. But I started to hear echoes in the contemporary fictions I was reading and these novels and other kinds of writings that were really just um, partly just the impulse to writing itself was one of the connections. Um, but that was a big part of it. And so it was just a kind of immersive experience before I felt like I could write biography. 
I just tried to read as much as I could. And it's that it was through the handwriting and the ephemera mm -hmm. that you get that, that, that intangible, mm -hmm. right? In some ways, uh, is a really huge pain to translate, to transcribe and translate someone's writing, someone's, um, you know, archival documents. But you get so much more from the experience because there's just something material that's present um, through the handwriting. And so um, I had to kind of sit with each one. And it was when I was, I started writing about or thinking about Judah Foy and writing about her novels. That was sort of the first thing that I did. And then it clicked because I had already written about Ra Shield and tried to understand her. In my first book, in my dissertation, I have a chapter on Ra Shield. And in my first book, The Hysterics Revenge, I have a chapter on Ra Shield where I try to see her as a feminist. And, mm -hmm. you know, the reading itself is not inconsistent, but the framework is just, it's wrong um, in that sense. And I just, something clicked and they're so different. That's another key part of it. So originally the book was just those two, but Judah Foy is this Catholic, conservative, very straight laced, even though she's lacing up her men's suit. Um, and Rachild is, always as a rebel and bohemian and, um, you know, around people who are just really more on the margins. Um, and I thought that's so interesting, these two contemporaries writing in different ways. And they're just, they're looking for the stories from the same time period that make sense to them. And they're choosing totally different stories. Um, and I just, it's just psychologically interesting to sort of think about what made that happen. It wasn't, you know, nature, nurture, culture. Um, and to think about this, you know, from this, that was part of the project, like this same moment in time, which is this period that I study and know very well, to see how they were working out the same questions. Um, and they would never be talked about together, because they're seen just as totally different. Um, and then I had this sort of recovered memory that I had come across Marc de Montifo and seen a photo of her somewhere. And that sort of completed the picture. Um, but it's not like there's a ton of these. The, the, the reason I was able to write it is because I'm kind of like, what I do is study 19th century French feminism and French women writers. And I'd studied feminism enough to know that wasn't what was being worked out here. And, um, and then it became very frustrating to me to watch over and over how they were misunderstood. Um, and, and, and it had to kind of work through my reluctance to use the word trans, to talk about this stuff. Um, and because you have to rely on ephem ephemera, right? Um, you can't, I remember early on, I had a reviewer review it, you know, you get these sort of outside readers for things. who was like, well, do they ever say that they're trans? <laughs> you know, like, wouldn't that be nice? But that's not that's the whole point. <laughs> that's the point. And I realized, you know, part of my argument is that we are assuming heterosexuality and gender normativity of people in the past. That is our baseline assumption. And there's absolutely no reason that we should start from that assumption, right? Really, we should start from the assumption that we don't know someone's gender identity and we don't know um, their sort of sexual inclinations, not because, you know, you weren't, it didn't exist in the 19th century. You didn't say I'm gay or I'm straight. Um, but we just make, we actually take so many later 20th century notions all the time and apply them unwittingly and unconsciously. Um, and so I was trying to just strip away at that and hear what, what they had to say for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, let this lens really let their stories come into view. And, and it did, it was just, once I kind of shifted focus, it was like, whoa, they're telling me everywhere. <laughs> They're talking about it all the time. Um, and that was, you know, that's a long answer. And that, I mean, that really comes out in your readings. It comes out in your readings, as I said, of the, of the photographs, of the literature, of the journals. Um, and I'm fascinated by this whole, this whole framework that you introduce in the book called Gender Stories. And the whole notion of gender stories is that rather than highlighting or trying to define people according to terms or labels, uh, that you you talk about people's identity or you try to understand or get underneath people's identity through stories right through through a broader a broader a broader swath of language let's say you know in, in you as a woman writer yourself are looking to 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 um to tease out so i guess i i um you you talked about the the limitations of reading our terms and labels back on to 19th century french women writers and i guess i want to ask you the inverse like 
what can we learn from their gender stories and this kind of broader set of um, this, this broader use of language that you that you managed to tap into into your in your book about how to talk about how to talk about identity today. In some ways, we get we have so many labels, trans and 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 race labels and ethnic labels and and gender identity and sexual identity labels that you know I know I at least feel when confronted sometimes with those check boxes like wait I'm none of these I like my my identity transcends all of these and um, can't be captured by them so. How, how can the whole notion of a gender story help us in this time when identity is such an important and, um, and, and critical issue of both self and empathy? How can those gender stories help us to get at that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an important, um, I think it's a kind of reframe that takes us away from thinking that the label tells us everything, right? Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that it's not that it, it, it's tempting to say like, okay, now we have the language. And so these poor people in the past didn't have the language and now we do. Um, and so there's this kind of progress narrative. Um, but I actually think that the language thing is consistent. The reason why we have these debates now is because it's still uh, a kind mm -hmm. of trigger point, right? Um, we can see in the past, we can see in their stories that they struggle with language. They just struggle to trans translate themselves into language, um, to know what they are, how to describe themselves. That's part of what these, this, they, they, each of them wrote, just reams and reams of story. You see this kind of obsessive storytelling um, and, and pull to writing, which see, was I interpret as a kind of need to keep making themselves real through language. Um, but, um, but that's, it's in some ways not so different from why language is so embattled now, why that we debate pronouns, because it's still about everyone and why there's so many memoirs and why there's so many of these stories being told, because it's not enough to read someone else's memoir. It never, it's not that they're all the same, right? What, what links them is the desire to translate oneself into writing rather than any notion of what trans means or what, what gender non-conforming means. Um, a friend of mine, um, some of you may know Emily Strauss, who introduced me to this book called Gender Born, Gender Made, which is, a, I think, what many psychologists turn to, and I can't remember the psychologist's name right now, but there's a notion in there, which I read after this manuscript, well, this was already in, in print, um, of the gender creative child, and this idea that you should listen to the kid, tell you, the kid knows who they are, and you should just let them tell you that, um, and that's a way of understanding gender identity in children and you know, they, they, they tell you who they are, they know, um, which is pretty incredible. Oh, Mason's posting this. Um, amazing. Um, That's tech skills. Yeah. yeah. And so I thought that was such a, I wish I had known that term when I wrote the book, because the gen gender creative is a way of thinking about Hashil. She was really experimenting with her gender expression. Um, but for e each of them, they really told me who they were. Um, and it wasn't something that I then, you know, that's part of why the pronoun question was so hard. I didn't want to decide, well, this one really wants to be he and that one wants they. That's a very personal choice always. Um, and that was not something that I felt like I could do um, as, a, as a scholar. Um, but, um, but yeah, the, la the I think, and I, the other piece is that the storytelling piece, I think is something we can all relate to. Um, and so in terms of I mean, I think stories are empathy generators. And I hope that this book is an empathy generator as well. Um, not that that should be a hard thing to generate, but um, you can always use more. Um, and I think that, you know, we can all relate to wanting to find ourselves in a story. I just watched the, the documentary recently, Disclosure, which is about trans representation in film. It's on Netflix. Um, and I highly recommend it. Um, it will make you like think very differently of all the movies you've ever seen in the 80s and 90s. You know, turns out making, you know, horrible stereotypes about trans people goes back to the beginning of cinema. But it's told through trans actors and producers who describe the experience of watching these films when they were young and at various points. And I think it's really, I'm sort of talking about the same thing. That's something that I noticed with, um, with all three of them, that they were looking for examples of themselves. And with Jules Lafoy, I talk about her scrapbook where she was clipping articles from newspapers and everything. And um, 
And she, and mo mostly they rejected the stories that were being told about gender. Even though transgender didn't exist as a thing, not in name, not in idea, no one had ever thought about, no, just didn't know that it was just not, gender identity wasn't something that people were describing really yet. Um, there wasn't a way to talk about gender, right? Just as much as this is before trans, it's before gender. That mm -hmm. word as separate from just your genitalia or what, you know, what you're named at birth didn't come into play until mid 20th century. The idea that these, this is, there's something separate between sex and gender. Um, and so um, um, I just went off on a different train of thought and now I can't remember what I was saying, but uh, <laughs> Anyway. Okay, friendly crowd. Um, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna ask you two more questions, more personal questions, and then I want to open it up to the friendly crowd to ask questions. Also. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, so here we are in, um, in a, in a book group um, for of the synagogue, and so I, I feel compelled to ask you, um, in what ways does your own Jewish identity shape your academic interests, and in what ways, if in any, is this book Jewish? <laughs> That's the real reason everyone is here, right? <laughs> um, the big, the big question. Yeah, I mean, um, Rachel asked me this um, when we were talking about what we would talk about, and I thought, oh my gosh, she knows me so well. Like, um, it's so in, it's so interesting to me to think about. No one's really asked me that, but um, you know, we're we are we are the people of the book, um, and I come from. A kind of a long line of, of rabbis and, and Jewish thinkers and Jewish professors. Um, so like that's part of me, like I inherited my, my intellectual personality, you know, my, my, my career choice, my father's a professor, the, my investment in the life of the mind. That's just sort of, you know, sort of born that way. Um, and it's a familial trait, but, um, and so I think I, I know to think about language and to think about texts and to look for yourself in stories, I think that's a very Jewish thing to do. Um, but for me, it wasn't, it, it wasn't really the Jewish text that, uh, that spoke to me or that, um, you know, that I, that I chose obviously to, to study because I was saying this to Rachel before. Um, I'm such a good girl that the only way I could find to rebel was to like choose a different language to get my PhD in for my Jewish study. Both my parents, my mother was a Hebrew teacher. Um, so I didn't pursue Hebrew, I pursued French and I showed them. Um, the universe has a way, of course I ended up at Yeshiva University and there would have been a more direct and obvious path to get there, um, but that's how things go. So, um, so I do truly think that my interest in languages in French comes from my parents who were fluent in Hebrew and, and very invested in the Hebrew language. Um, and that's originally why I, I enjoyed studying it, not the rebellion part, but just I loved, my family loved languages and I, and I love that too. Um, but I think, you know, the other piece of it is that um, I think that's part of my interest in Jula Foi in particular as this Catholic who was, who wanted to remain Catholic, right? We know there, and people, there's so many things that go into how people respond to um, the culture in which they grew up in, if they are, feel themselves, themselves different or to find, not find a place in it. And what's amazing about her is that she went to Catholic lore. She went to the Joan of Arc story. She went to the stories of the transvestite saints, so-called, right? Um, and that's, those are the stories she re retold and recognized herself in. And she also went to the Joseph story. Um, there's a story um, in, in the book about girls becoming boys. She identifies with Joseph having left his family and not being recognized and then wanting to be recognized. And she talks about this desire for recognition um, in that novel and to want to be, want to be recognized as this person who is both the person they knew and, and not that person, right? To be seen in, in some other way. I think that's a really, um, I think that story is fascinating as a trans story. And I think it's a fascinating story that we can relate to from a lot of different ways, right? The ways in which we, we, we are different from our families, but we want our families to recognize the sameness and, and the difference and just to be seen and, and recognized even as we evolve. So I think it's all, that, that part is all, very Jewish now. 
Very Jewish. Very <laughs> Jewish. And, and also I'll point out that as you, uh, you said to me that Susa is uh, Shushan, yeah. right? So oh yeah, so as a, as a YU professor, I always have my little Jewish moment here, crossover. <laughs> Um, and yeah, Shushan, I wasn't, it took me a while to notice that, um, but yeah, Shushan. So um, that's my little Purim story. Yeah, and in fact, the Judafois were sometimes invited by the Jewish communities of France to come and speak about their discoveries because they truly thought that they had found Ahasuerus' palace, by the way. And if you look up the New York Times article about it from 1885 or so, it mentions like, French explorers have found the, the, you know, the palace of, how are you saying? Incredible it? story. Yeah. 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 So there's wow, so wow. many fun little okay. facts. So I have one more question for you and then I'm going to open it up and I see Stephanie Eyes already has her hand up. So she's first. <laughs> okay. So as I was reading, um, and I pointed this out to you, so this is not a surprise question. I was so struck by, I think in particular by the, by the fact that you were getting to go to Paris and to go to all of these places where these authors were. You went to L'Hôtel de la Foi and to, the, to, where Jane, to where Madame Jane lived. And you, you know, were able to photograph her fireplace and see just where she stood in the portraits you were looking at. And, and your, your excitement about that was evident in the, in the prose of the book itself. But then when you get to the conclusion, there's this wonderful moment of ephemera that I encountered as a, as a, a reader of you, Rachel Nash, woman writer, <laughs> which is that you describe your own experience of being in L'Hôtel de la Foi and um, Michel, is that the name of the guy? So this yeah. is a man, Michel, who's the, who is the sure, yeah. of the of the space. And he hears that you're doing this research project and he offers to take you up to the attic of the hotel and to show you, you know, just some stuff that's up there. And of course you come across a box of stuff that belonged to Jane de la Foy. And like, and you're, there's nothing, there's nothing short of exhilaration in your description of what it felt like to actually be there and touch her stuff and be in that place and, and, and be going through this. And it struck me here is Rachel, um, now an archeologist in a certain way of the archeologist, right? Jane had her whole, whole, own whole self-discovery. She went through, through digging up these ruins in Persia and now you're up there in the attic digging through what she's left behind. What did you learn about yourself as a woman writer through the process of writing this book? It's such a great question. Um, and I'm gonna have to just keep thinking about it. Um, but I, I, I love the idea of myself as this archeologist. And I'm also like, I'm kind of a shy person. Everything that I do in my research, I mean, the reason I'm a, an academic partly is because I like being alone and writing. I also like the public facing part of it, but I can really, I like to just kind of disappear into things um, some of the time to recharge. And, um, but this, going to Paris, you have to talk to people who speak in French. You have all these experiences. And luckily I have a lot of wonderful colleagues who I get to share that with. And we all sort of know we have these, Amer you know, these American experiences as scholars in French. And I was actually staying in an apartment with one of those friends at the time, my friend Masha, um, who got like the play by play. I'm texting her like, oh my God, I'm going in. This is crazy. Um, and so, yes, it was unbelievably exhilarating. I was shaking because I didn't, I was going, it was called the Hotel du Lafoy. It's the Red Cross headquarters, but it's just in a random location. I knew it was there. I wasn't sure what I was going to find there. I knew there was a painting there. Um, no one was answering the phone and I just like kind of on a lark, got on the bus, went out there and, um, and I, I'm buzzing. No one's answering. I'm thinking this is going to be a wash and it would just be cool because it has her name on the, on the thing. And, um, and then the guy lets me in, you know, and I say, I'm an American, I'm doing this research. He's like so excited to see me because he's also just kind of hanging out there and not seeing a lot of people. And it's her fireplace that you saw in that first image. Her living room is totally intact. It just has a lot of random junk in it, unfortunately, like plastic tables and things. But it's her, her space. Um, and like looking at the handwriting, right, all of that all of those, those ephemera, being in contact with it was absolutely thrilling and exciting and adventurous and all of that. And I was thinking about the question because Junafua had no connection to Persia, right? She's a Catholic. It's not even taking her, she kind of talks about, you know, the land of the Bible and all of that. But, um, but it's not really that direct of a, a connection. Um, and yet 
it was a place that transformed her. Um, and I have no cor direct correction, connection to Paris, right? Um, everyone always asks me that also, like, why French? Now you know, because I was just being rebellious. Um, <laughs> but, um, but there's no family there. I wish there was. It would make it easier. Um, uh, places to stay and whatnot. But it just was my own path that I needed to forge to sort of be independent and, and figure things out. And so I feel like it was sort of the culmination of that. It was like, I doing this whole project, found myself there. This is totally intriguing to me. It's kind of totally mine in a way, not that it shouldn't be open to other scholars, but it felt, you know, really, it did really kind of feel like that kind of discovery. And I didn't realize how much of the thrill was about identify, identifying with her um, in that sense. I, would, I did not have to fight off any bandits or anything like that. <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank goodness. That direct contact, um, it was very exciting. And in a way, it was just an amplified version of what I often experience in my research, which um, generally I've been lucky to find, you know, to kind of fall in love with what I'm doing and let that lead me. Um, and I will like exclaim from my office, you know, right here at this desk, if I'll find something like, oh my God, this is amazing. And, and that's why this tonight is really special for me because it's super exciting to find these things. And there's a very small group of people who will take pleasure to be even those, even those people don't really even know why it's so exciting. There's so much work to convince people that what you just figured out is interesting and exciting. And so when the book comes out, that expands the reach. And I really tried to write, write it in a way that would make it possible for my friends to read it and it not be full of jargon and too many footnotes and things well, like that. Well, you succeeded unequivocally. Thanks well, thank you. comes through. Thank you. Well, that is like a huge gift to, to me to be able to, to talk to you about it um, and to have, you know, all my, to have so many friends and um, fellow congregants <laughs> here tonight. So, yeah. So Stephanie Ives. Okay. Um, oh, I'm unmute myself. There we go. I love this book. I've told you that. I'll tell everybody that. And one of the things I really, really loved about it is that um, it's like clearly in an incredibly well-researched book, but it's, it read to me like a novel. And, um, and, I, and I read it in like, a bit, like two sittings. It was amazing. So I have two questions, but you can really choose one because there are other people here. Yeah. One was... Um, you know, thinking about the pants permit, and Rashid, I, can, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Is Rashid? Mm -hmm. Okay, Rashid, um, uh, her life. One of the things I kept thinking about was um, how privilege um, allowed her to do what she, like she had the privilege of being married to this man who I'm fascinated by. I would love to know his story. Um, and You're talking about Julafwa, not Rashid. Julafwa, not Rashid. Excuse me, Julafwa. Rashid, I can, yes, the, that I can pronounce either. Uh, do it for I can't and um and just thinking about like uh how much she was able to get away with because of her stature and and also sort of wondering like would her life been as a you know as a religious catholic woman um would her life have been harder today or was it easier back then without the titles like it was I was wondering in general like um kind of comparing to like today, what it means to be a person who has um, the privilege of so many other things and how it allows you maybe to get away with one thing. And, um, and then the other topic in general was, I wanted to know how you wanted this to be, how you think about the trans community's reception of your book and what, what if anything, you hope it would do for um, trans people. Okay. Yeah. Maybe the first one was just more of a comment. I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I can't really say, right. Would it be easier today or not? I w I can, or harder today, but I totally, I hear what you're saying because um, in some ways it was easier to be trans before there was a label that could be denigrated and the object of, I mean, that's what you see. Actually, they talk about that in a disclosure documentary that visibility, unfortunately, has often come with violence and all kinds of other horrible things. So not knowing for all of them, not knowing, not having a thing to attack. Others are like, oh, you guys are hysterical women. That, that didn't really make sense, didn't really add up. And so then they just kind of stopped worrying about them. And they flew under the radar because if you were a woman behaving that way in a it was more threatening. But since they didn't seem to be starting some kind of feminist movement or anything, 
in some ways, and especially Judah Fah, absolutely, all the privilege. She was, I mean, she was kind of an imperialist. She modeled herself on a certain kind of French masculinity, which is, you know, not necessarily something to be admired. Um, and that's a super interesting part of, of, of the story, but all the privilege, and you can't imagine, there's no equivalent, but bringing back treasures from Persia to the Louvre puts you in a category we have no, there's just nothing that sort of compares today, but you can do whatever you want because that was like a really badass thing to do. And it made France feel really good about itself when it was feeling like very vulnerable in the second half of the 19th century after the defeat of the Franco-Prussian War. So anything that made them look good to other Europeans like that, you just, you know, that real, and she just kind of rode that and always people would make, the one thing that people sort of made fun of her that she was always talking about Persia. <laughs> she wanted to always reroute the conversation. Remember, I'm the person that did this amazing thing. Um, and as far as the trans community today, I mean, I, I hope that they read this. Um, I really, I wanted to supply that history to the extent possible. Um, I really wanted, I want that to, to be out there. I mean, I think there's a lot of, there are people who are, first of all, right now with JK Rowling, speaking of stories, um, there's a lot of transphobia out there um, and it's had a kind of resurgence, unfortunately. Um, and, um, and I just, I, you know, sort of a question about, well, this is a new thing and, and, and a really uh, the, mis the misunderstanding that this has not been around kind of forever. So I run it, when I, I saw how much pain they, these three subjects were all in and not being able to locate themselves in history. And it was a kind of repeated effort. And so I wanted to at least make clear that there, there is a history. I also wanted it up to open it up to scholars in my field um, there are very, very few trans scholars, even, you know, not even that many queer scholars. And so as a, if there were, I, I wouldn't necessarily, if there were more, I wouldn't necessarily be the one doing this work. Um, but I want to make it, I, I think part of why you choose your, even a scholarly field has to do with the kind of role models you see in the field and the kind of work that's possible. So if this makes it possible for other kinds of gender, people with different gender identities to um, to enter, you know, into the scholarship, um, or just to be able to write about these things, um, you know, I, I'm happy to be sort of an ally in that way. Um, I don't want to have ownership over it, because I really do think it's important for trans people to be telling their, you know, to, to, have, to be able to tell their own stories. Thank you. Yoni Schwab. So speaking of uh, first of all, I, did, I really enjoyed, I wasn't able to read the whole book, but I read a big chunk, which I really appreciated. Um, one of the things that I, what's kind of amazing is in addition to their dressing, obviously differently than one would expect um, them to be dressing at that time period, was also that they, as you said, worked out a lot of their identity or their ideas about themselves publicly through writing. Um, it wasn't just private writing, just some diary writing, but they were publishing and that those, you know, certainly the things they were publishing were also going to, you know, are going to correlate with anyone who knew them or saw them walking on the street um, with how they were dressing. And so I'm curious kind of both what were the contemporary reactions were to that um, and what influence that might have had on the direction of gender going forward. I mean, obviously they were, you know, so far ahead of their times in terms of, um, in terms of trying to work out something more complex than a binary sexuality um, and yet and they were doing it publicly and, and through story as you describe um, what seeds were planted at the time how did people how do people uh, as you could tell ingest that or you know kind of uh, digest that and then you know kind of do we see any of those seeds later on and maybe that's beyond what you were able to study but I'm curious what you think about that that working out in public yeah um... You know, Jules Lafroy is acknowledged in um, um, a book, the book called uh, Transgender Warriors by um, Leslie Feinberg, which was from the 1990s, but is a kind of history of trans and there's a picture of Jules Lafroy in there. So she kind of made her way into this, this history somehow. And Feinberg doesn't quite know what to do with her, which sort of asks like, well, who is this person? What's going on here? Um, but um, it, it, it's, they, they did write about it publicly to a certain extent. They weren't always clear what they were writing or what they were revealing. Jules Lafroy writes these novels about, and it's set in these kind of historical fictions. Um, and it's not something 
it's not something that's stigmatized, right? And so she writes it in the genre of historical fiction and a Joan of Arc story. So it doesn't feel quite so controversial. That's her way of kind of accommodating that. Um, and people were, people, they weren't, they were dense, difficult novels. Um, they were not huge bestsellers. Rashield, on the other hand, writes Mr. Venus, um, her, her, her gender bending, sort of the thing that put her onto the literary scene when she's down and out, very beginning of her career, has no money, is desperate, is depressed, is really struggling, doesn't think anyone's going to read it. And she says she kind of writes it in a fugue state over a couple of weeks, and it becomes this succès de scandale, becomes this like super popular, controversial thing. And so all of a sudden she's in the public sphere accidentally, and she's revealed, that's where my argument is that she accidentally kind of put herself out there. She really didn't think anyone was going to pay attention. Um, and then she sort of, everyone says, yeah, you're exactly this character, which by the way, she totally is. There's, you know, I kind of do that in the, in the book, show how that character and so many features of that link back to her life. Uh, and she denies for a while. And then she's sort of like, okay, to, you know, that's the to be strange or nothing at all, because they still couldn't say what it was. Um, and so that it just created a space for her to be radical and rebellious. And there was a way in which Rashid realized over the course of her life, she kept saying exactly what she was. No one understood her, and they always thought she was joking or being, you know, provocative. And that's the, that's been the prevailing narrative. Oh, she was provocative. She wore pants to be prov provocative. She did all these things to be provocative. And I think we really want to think about, you know, usually when someone's being provocative, there's a reason for that, and there's, you know, something else going on. Um, and so that wasn't the only, you know, she wasn't doing it to be provocative. Her personality was provocative. And, um, and so she kind of settled into that and realized, oh, I can say whatever I want because no one has a clue what I mean. So she said over and over, I'm not a woman. She started referring to herself as a werewolf when she was older, which, you know, she was like, I don't see any humans that are like me. I seem to be more than one thing. I kind of really like animals. Maybe that's a better way to understand myself. And people again were like, oh, Rashield, that's such a Rashield thing. Um, but I think she was being dead serious all the time. And when you go back and read her writing with that in mind, you, she gives you so much information and it kind of all lines up. Um, and so it, it, that goes back to, to Stephanie's question, I think, right? It didn't, it, it, it was in some ways easier because people didn't recognize this as a dangerous thing because they didn't have the word or the vocabulary for it. And you know, it's not to say that we shouldn't have a way of describing these things, but it's interesting that that was um, somehow, in some ways, a, a freer time to to live these identities. Um, before I hand it back to Rabbi Greenberg, Rachel, if you could just tell us one primary source from your research that you encountered that is available in English that you would recommend that we would read if we were interested in this time period or any of these authors. Prime, you mean like a novel? A novel. Yeah. Um, so most of the novels are not um, in translation or um, available. Next project. But <laughs> right. Yeah. So I, hope, I want someone else to do that. So I don't yeah. Know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, you can read Rush Shield's novels. There are MLA, um, which publishes these. So make sure to, I mean, you can read them in French if you wish, but they also, um, Monsieur Venus, you can read in English. I teach it in my classes all the time. So um, that's, that's where I would start. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing your book and your time with us. Thanks to all of you for coming. And I'm gonna hand it back to Rabbi Greenberg for one announcement. Thank you. Great, so uh, thank you to both Rachel, such a thought provoking conversation. I'm really looking forward to reading the book and I really loved how you framed it as a book that creates empathy, just a beautiful thing. So thank you both for your time and for sharing this with the community. Um, and I just wanted to give a plug for the upcoming book talks. Um, this coming Thursday at eight, Deborah Cahan, Cobb and Sarah Stern, who are two, two poets who are members of the congregation are gonna be talking to each other about their newest books. So that should be excellent. So that's Thursday at eight. Next Sunday and Monday, Judy Bamel, also a member of the congregation, um, wrote a new book of poetry and is doing an interesting thing where she is asking everyone to sign up on a Google Doc for 10 minute slots. She'll choose a poem specifically for, for you and read it for you and let you have a little conversation. Um, wow. So that's gonna be next Sunday and Monday. I'll send the times will be coming out in, a, in an e-blast. Um, 
And then the final one for now is Rabbi Ehud Sela, who was a congregant many years ago, who wrote an author called, uh, who wrote a book called Seeing Angels in the Shadow of Death. That's going to be Thursday, August 13th at 8. So it's really great. And I had a few people even message me that they wrote books that I didn't even know about. So if you know anyone else in the congregation who wrote a book, let me know. We would love for them to come and talk. Or if you yourself wrote a book, let me know. Um, so thank you very much to both Rachel's and Shavuot everyone. Have a lovely night. Thank you.